This is a production of Cornell University. Uh, get started. Thank you. Those of you who are here, thank you very much for being here. Uh, my name is Warren Allman. I'm the director of the Paleontological Research Institution across the lake and the, uh, the organizer of, of uh, this year's Darwin Day weekend. Uh, this is Ithaca's second Darwin Day weekend, uh, uh, following from last year, which was very successful. And you should be marking your calendars now for 2009, which is the bicentennial of his birth. Uh, my role is to introduce uh, this event and then to participate in it. But before I do, I just want to remind, some of you may already have been to everything so far, but I just want to remind you that tonight in this room, David Sloan Wilson, who's a very noted uh, philosopher and uh, evolutionary biologist, philosopher of biology, uh, will be speaking here uh, on, um, I believe his title is, if it, is it on here? Yes. Evolution for Everyone, How Darwin's Theory Can Change the Way We Think About Our Lives. And that is the title of a program that he runs at SUNY Binghamton and also of his forthcoming book, which I believe he will be talking about. He's the author, also the author of Darwin's Cathedral, which is a, a, a wonderful recent book. Tomorrow, a full day of activities at the museum, starting at 10 o'clock with a reading from by the two actors, the two lead actors who will be playing in Inherit the Wind at the Schwartz Center at Cornell uh, in April. Uh, and the director of that, Beth Miles, and I will be introducing that uh, at 10 o'clock. So it's a preview of what will be coming to the Cornell campus in April and May. And then uh, at noon at the museum, John Gerchi, who is arguably the most famous and, and talented paleo artist in the world today, certainly the leading paleo artist of ancient humans, who is, residence, or who is artist in residence at PRI right now, will be speaking at noon. Uh, his talk will be called, What the Fossil Record Can Tell Us About Human Nature, and He Should Know. And then, uh, if you don't want to go to the museum, tomorrow at 5 o'clock at Cornell Cinema in, in Willard Strait, a screening of Flock of Dodos, which is the film documentary we showed last year. And it was so popular, we brought it back this year, and we'll be showing it today, uh, sorry, tomorrow at 5 o'clock, and then on Sunday at 7.15, also in Willard Strait, where we will have a Q&A afterwards. And then tomorrow evening, uh, a birthday party for Charles Darwin, and the highlight of which will be a live performance uh, by very famous Darwin impersonator and author uh, Richard Milner. If uh, you think none of that stuff sounds interesting for small kids, then Tomorrow from 11 till 4, there will be family activities at the museum. If you think you can't make Darwinism interesting to four-year-olds, go prove yourself wrong. It is my pleasure to introduce the last of our three panel discussions of this weekend's events. We, the theme of this year's Darwin Day festivities is evolution and human nature. And we thought in the planning of this that eugenics is, was a natural topic to cover, even though it's certainly not cutting-edge science today. It was thought to be cutting-edge science 100 years ago, and that includes here at Cornell. And so we uh, thought that since this topic frequently comes up in discussions of evolution, particularly as it regards human nature, that, uh, and since we have resources here at Cornell that uh, know a lot about this topic, we thought that we would end our three panels with this discussion. My colleague and expert on all things historic, Will Provine, will be moderating. And uh, thank you again all for being here. Thank you, Warren. My name is Will Provine. I'm a historian of modern evolutionary biology and genetics. I've been keenly interested in the history of eugenics for a very long time. And w let me first introduce the panel. You've already met Warren Allman. You know that he is the director of the Paleontological Research Institution and Museum of the Earth. Next to him is uh, Brian Caviar. Brian has just graduated from Cornell with his undergraduate degree. He was a student in my evolution course for non-majors. And he wrote for that class a paper on the history of eugenics at Cornell. And he will share with you his research that he did for that paper. And I guarantee you it's an eye-opening story to hear about Cornell's history with eugenics. And following him is Alan McNeil at the end of the table. 
he's going to talk about eugenics past and future. I'm going to introduce the issue of eugenics by talking about it both past, present, and future. The history of eugenics goes back into unrecorded time. There is not a human culture that has not paid attention to producing the best children that it can. Humans have always selected for that. Parents of children who are getting ready to be married are always keen to have a hand in this process to choose the right people for their children, and in many cultures they do so, or committees of people do the choosing for them. I must say that such a committee could have done a better job than I've done with my own life. But that's all right. We'll leave that aside for the moment. And we'll come back to the problem of eugenics. So eugenics has been a part of human culture from time immemorial, way back before recorded history. The problem is that we couldn't figure out ways of really dealing effectively with our understanding of how we would go about eugenics until we had Mendelian inheritance. We had the beginnings of eugenics in the 19th century by that name, Francis Galton, the cousin of, of Charles Darwin, invented that name. But it couldn't go very far until there was some substance of heredity to go with it. So thus, when Mendelism came on the scene, there was a blossoming of eugenics in the United States and indeed all over the world. There were eugenics movements in Norway, Sweden, Denmark, all over Central Europe, in Russia, in Japan, and indeed almost everywhere in the world where they had universities, they had courses on eugenics. So what we had in the early part of this century is a very focused uh, interest in improving the human breed. To give you an example of that, in 1924, the American Museum of Natural History hosted the Second International Congress of Eugenics. Present were the geneticists from all over the world interested in human heredity, including a, a stellar array from Britain and the United States, but from many other nations as well. And it signaled the interest of geneticists in eugenics. It was a, probably in the mid-20s, it was the high point of what we think of usually as eugenics. The problem with eugenics was it got into the terrible situation in Germany in the mid-1930s, and when the information of this came out, nobody wanted to have much of anything more to do with eugenics. And the histories of eugenics, we have available to us now by Mark Haller, by Dan Kevlis, and by a number of other people, all end with the same story that we almost heard from my colleague Warren Allman just a few moments ago. Namely, in the early 20th century was when it was really big, but of course eugenics has completely died down since then. Now I would take a very different view about this. I would say that eugenics is more alive now than it was in 1925. The reason why was that in 1925, we didn't know very much about human heredity. And therefore, we couldn't advise people a whole lot on who to marry and things like that. Now we know uh, something about human heredity. For example, in 1954, there was a book published on human heredity, Mendelian heredity in man, by Victor Mikusi from Johns Hopkins. And that was a small book about this big. That book has grown into a series of volumes wider than I can spread my hands. And it's available basically online. You can't even get it on DVDs. You can only get it in, in online, basically. And that's only a drop in the bucket compared to what we will know 10 years from now. Just think about it. What we know right now about human heredity will be completely dwarfed by what we know about human heredity in only 10 years from now. So the time for eugenics is now, and it's alive 
and very well at the present time. Do you know what we call it? We call it genetic counseling. And the genetic counseling offices are exactly what Charles Benedict Davenport proposed in 1911 in his book on human inheritance and eugenics. Davenport did not believe in positive eugenics that required people not to have children. He only advocated sterilization of people who were in mental institutions. That was the only thing he advocated that was positive in terms of eugenics. He believed in voluntary centers that would advise people on their genetics. That's exactly what genetic counseling centers do now. We have schools of genetic counseling at UCLA and other schools, medical schools as well, and it is a growing, growing field. So if you think that eugenics has disappeared, you are wrong. And if you're a eugenics counselor now, or a genetic counselor now, you know how not to insert yourself in people's decisions. You only tell them what the possibilities are, and you do not give them any encouragement whatsoever to go one way or the other. And they're trained not to give people a sign of what they really think. So then it becomes a question of the body language. When a person comes before you and says, I'm an older woman, I don't think I want to have genetic testing. Well, you explain to her what you can find out by the genetic testing and what you can't find out by it. And th th you can give her the figures. You can say 99% of women do get checked uh, at this age that you are as having your baby and, and go on from there. What you do is you let your body language give your answer to the person that you're dealing with. And that is something that you can't get rid of. So I think we have already a kind of positive eugenics going in a very live way. And the possibilities are absolutely endless. Because when you look at what techniques are available, they can take from a woman 10 maybe half, perhaps of her eggs. And you can take those eggs and fertilize them outside of her with the sperm of several different men, if you wished, but of her husband, if you wanted to. And you, then you take those 10, and each of them, you go to an eight cell stage, you steal away one or two and test them. And you can amplify the DNA, and you can have a very good idea of what's in that genome. And then you can fertilize her with the genome, with the fertilized egg, that's the best for her and him. So, wow, look at that possibility that we have for eugenics right there. And are people making use of it? They most certainly are. Are people making use of genetic testing to find out whether they have a male or a female? And will some women abort for that reason? Yes, not so much in the US, but certainly abroad. So eugenics is not only alive and well, it's in practice, it's there, it's a feature of our life, and the question is whether in the future, when we have a dearth of resources which we don't face right now immediately, but which we could easily face in the future, what happens then? And at that time, I think it will be extraordinarily difficult to avoid positive eugenics in many countries of the world. And if you think it's impossible to do that, just look at the history of the United States and see how easily our so-called fundamental rights can be changed. They can be changed in a hurry. The, past, the current president that we has, have right now has changed our fundamental liberties very substantially in a short period of time. It could be much more severe than that. I expect to see when there is a dearth of resources, that people will feel we need to have more eugenics. We have to watch human heredity. We can't afford to have children who are seriously genetically impaired in any way, shape, or form because it costs too much money. I expect to see that be instituted into law. And if we think eugenics is a thing of the past, wait till that time. And that time will come in the, in the lifetimes of the young, young people in this audience, in all likelihood, but certainly in the time of their children. So eugenics in the past, a lot of connections with racism, sexism, and other things. 
Now, not so much, but it's still alive and very well at the present time. In the future, it's likely to be even more important. Why? Well, unlike, unlike Will, I'm not a historian of, of evolutionary biology. I'm a practicing paleontologist. And so I hardly know anything about eugenics uh, except what I read in, in the history books. But I do uh, have one interesting perspective to, to offer from the history of paleontology. And that's because a very important paleontologist played a enormous role in some of the history that Will just related. Uh, his name was Henry Fairfield Osborne. He's not a household name now, but uh, in the 19-teens and 1920s, he was arguably the most famous scientist in America. He was, uh, if there had been such a thing at the time, he would have been the one on, the, on Nightline and on the radio every time somebody wanted a quote from, certainly from a paleontologist, uh, and even maybe from an evolutionary biologist. He was a, a very, very important household name in the 1920s. And uh, he was also uh, the president of the American Museum of Natural History, which I imagine most of you are familiar with in New York City. He is single-handedly responsible, he was single-handedly responsible for building that museum into the powerhouse that it is today. It's the, it's the largest and most powerful museum in the world today. And that is essentially the, a consequence of, of his efforts. He was a brilliant popularizer of science, and particularly paleontology, and much of what we think of when we think of dinosaurs, for example, or cavemen, uh, pardon the expression, um, is due to Henry Fairfield Osborne. Much of what we think about museum exhibits should look like is due to him. So in other words, he, this is not a marginal character, is the point of all that. As Will said, the Second International Congress of, Genetic, of, of Eugenics was uh, actually occurred at the American Museum of Natural History in 1924, and Osborne was the, the uh, president of that Congress. He was a major player in the American eugenics movement. Now, all of this uh, was being done by a man who actually studied fossil horses and rhinoceroses and elephants. So what's the connection? And that's really what I want to talk about and, and why I think uh, that that I guess I will share some of Will's uh, dark prognostication here in, insofar as uh, anybody, any scientist, can, can come up with any idea. And sometimes scientists who uh, are, are very smart people will be listened to when they talk about things they don't really know anything about. So that's my punchline. Um, Henry Fairfield Osborne was educated at Princeton and uh, then uh, founded the biology department at Columbia University. He was then uh, hired to uh, go to the American Museum, and he eventually became its president. He, by marriage, he was the nephew of a gentleman named J.P. Morgan, and uh, that provided essentially unlimited financial resources for him and for the museum to do all the wonderful things that, that Osborne decided to do. The early 20th century was a fascinating time. It was both at the beginning of a new century and a very forward-looking time, but it was also a time of enormous uncertainty in America and, I guess, the rest of the world. And it's the time of, if you remember your American history, that it is the, usually called the Progressive Era. It begins with the administrations of, of Theodore Roosevelt and ends with uh, the Depression, more or less. And during all that time, there was enormous optimism and enormous energy and enormous um, vitality in American culture that all kinds of things were possible. And Osborne and Roosevelt and many of the leaders of eugenics, and this is the, one of the ironies, many of the leaders of the eugenics movement were progressives. Those two words don't seem, don't, uh, to modern ears, don't uh, seem like they go together. But many leaders of eugenics were politically and socially progressives. And uh, that connection is a, is a very interesting one, and there's stacks of books about it. Uh, I just want to point out that, that things that make sense in current politics or current sociology doesn't necessarily make sense 100 years later. Uh, Osborne probably wouldn't have politically called himself uh, a liberal. 
Um, he was a very close personal friend of Theodore Roosevelt. Uh, Roosevelt and Osborne shared a lot of things in common. One is that they were parts of the same upper crust of American WASP society. Uh, and the other is that they were both forward-looking, ambitious, action-oriented people who wanted to change the world, but they were also simultaneously scared to death of the changes that were going on in America and in the world in general. And that's really the context of, of uh, what Osborne thought about eugenics. Osborne studied fossil mammals. And he did so at a time before we, we did understand the beginnings of Mendelism. As Will said, Mendel was rediscovered in 1900, and uh, we began to understand inheritance. But we didn't understand how inheritance was connected to uh, evolution and the process of evolution, the way we read about in books today, for example. That, the, the, what we read about in textbooks today is called the modern synthetic view of evolution or neo-Darwinism. And that set of ideas didn't come along until the 1940s and 50s. In the 1920s, we kind of understood evolution, but, but we really didn't. And uh, as some of you may know, Darwinism, meaning natural selection, was not very popular. Everybody believed in evolution. That is, every uh, biologist believed in evolution. But natural selection was not very popular, and Osborne was one of the leaders of the opposition to natural selection. Osborne believed that there were inherent drives, inherent forces, inherent processes inside the evolutionary process that drove organisms forward in their evolution. And those processes were quite mysterious, but he still gave them names and uh, wrote books about them. And he claimed that the trends that he saw in the fossil record, which he was, he was the world's expert on the, on the evolution of mammals, he claimed that those trends that he was so familiar with were driven by these mysterious internal forces. And they were all driven to uh, progress. They were all driven toward perfection and optimality. So much so that they could be driven past optimality into obsolescence. So he, uh, he described trends in horns and antlers and body size and other features of, of various mammals. And then he said that they actually evolved too much past their optimum and uh, transcended what they should have evolved into, and that's why they went extinct. That was cutting-edge paleontology and cutting-edge evolutionary biology in the 1920s. And uh, we laugh at it today. Why we laugh at it today is, is what I want to, to come back to at the very end. So Osborne studied mammals, horses, uh, rhinos, uh, extinct animals like called titanotheres, which are even bigger than rhinos, and most of all elephants. And Osborne concluded from all of these studies of mammals that there were these, these grand sweeping trends through the history of, of mammals. Well, humans are mammals, and so Osborne naturally got interested in human evolution. Now, Unlike today, when there's a, a relative uh, flood of fossils from Africa and other places, uh, there are lots and lots of fossil humans today known. In the early two decades of the 20th century, there were hardly any, and, and none of them had been found in Africa that we're so familiar with today. So there was a lot of theorizing and not much data. And so Osborne was free to basically invent anything he wanted to in terms of theories. And one of the theories that he came up with was that uh, human evolution was centered not in Africa, which we believe today, but in Central Asia. And the reason he thought that had to do with his studies of fossil mammals. And one parenthetical to all of this is that uh, Osborne was so interested in this that he raised a bunch of money to send expeditions to the middle of Central Asia, Mongolia, in the Gobi Desert, looking for fossil humans. They didn't find any fossil humans, but they found some of the greatest dinosaur graveyards in the world, and th those were uh, discovered by Roy Chapman Andrews, who you may have heard of, who was the inspiration for Indiana Jones. So it didn't uh, uh, discover anything about human evolution, but it discovered a lot about dinosaur evolution. All of that was rooted in Osborne's thinking about humans. So uh, Osborne was naturally drawn to ideas about human evolution being driven toward uh, uh, 
driven upward in a progressive way. So all of that was, was quote-unquote good science at the time, and no one would have criticized Osborne, no one did, and no one really should criticize Osborne for coming to those conclusions. We now think those conclusions are incorrect, but Osborne came to them the same way many of us come to uh, our scientific conclusions, with a little bit of bias and a lot of uh, imagination and some data, and, and he tested some of them, and some of them didn't come out very well, and so forth. So that's, that's really not an object of criticism. The reason none of you have probably heard much about Henry Fairfield Osborne has, has really not much to do with those ideas, even though they were kind of squirrely in our modern uh, context. The reason most of uh, us don't think about Henry Fairfield Osborne today is because uh, he is widely judged to be a vicious racist. And he came to that racism and he, and he took that racism and he, and he stapled it to his evolutionary biology and his paleontology in such a way as to have enormous influence. And while the eugenics movement was getting off the ground in the early 20th century among geneticists and, and biologists and uh, uh, legislators and politicians, Henry Fairfield Osborne was giving it enormous legitimacy in the context of evolutionary biology. He had studied the fossil record. He had learned that progressive evolution was the rule. He had learned that humans were mammals, the same as everything else, and therefore would follow the rules of evolution. And by doing that, he gave a, a patina, a, more than a patina, a, a, a status to eugenic science that it now seems incredible to us. Now if you listen to the stuff that Will just uh, talked about and, uh, and, and what some of the other panelists will talk about, you, you hold your head and you say, how could these people have believed this stuff? But it was, it was given uh, scientific legitimacy by people like Osborne. Osborne died in 1935, and it's probably a good thing. Uh, he, uh, he died in 1935, and uh, as a result of his disappearance, two things, or, or connected uh, at the same time as his, as his disappearance, two things happened. One is, of course, Hitler had come to power in 1933. And already by 1933, as a result of the consolidation of Nazi power, uh, as early as 1933, common commentators were already saying, wow, this is what happens when eugenics is taken extremely seriously. Uh, now, that was a little bit disingenuous for Americans because in 1924, well, beginning in, the, in about 1904, but all the way up into the mid-1920s, immigration restriction had been enacted by Congress, uh, get, providing quotas for every country that sent immigrants here or from where immigrants came proportional to their non-white uh, content. In other words, countries that were all white and, and all uh, Caucasian, uh, that was fine. They could send as many as they wanted to, but countries that were deemed to be non-white had strict quotas that were based on the population of the United States in 1890, before the big waves of immigration came, before the non-Northern European waves of immigration came. So eugenics in this country had the very real consequence of causing immigration restriction. But by the 1930s, observers of Nazi Germany were drawing the obvious conclusion, and eugenics began to die a very swift scientific death anyway in the 1930s. So Osborne would not have uh, liked that very much. But also, Osborne's death coincided with the rise of the evolutionary synthesis, neo-Darwinism. And so uh, by the 1940s, by the late 1940s, it was a completely different scientific and intellectual world in so many ways, of course, but for evolutionary biology, two enormous things had changed. And this, again, is very difficult for us to understand today, but two, the, 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 uh, the landscape of evolution had utterly changed in two very important ways. The first was that eugenics was completely discredited. And it happened just like that. It happened in less than a decade, began in in the uh, mid-1930s, and it was over by the time the Second World War ended, eugenics was gone as a science. It, as Will has pointed out, it got relabeled as various things, and of course racism didn't go away, 
Uh, but eugenics as a cutting edge science uh, was gone. And along with that were evolutionary biological views like Osborne held. And those disappeared at the same time as, this, as, the, uh, uh, as eugenics and yielded to the modern synthesis that we now read about in textbooks. So why is this interesting? It's interesting because in, in the 1920s, Osborne was probably uh, the most popular, quoted, powerful scientist in America. And 20 years later, he was persona non grata. And today, uh, nobody wants to praise Henry Fairfield Osborne for anything. If you, if, if you Google him or look him up, very few people will say anything nice about this guy. Uh, his statue is very carefully hidden at the American Museum, by the way. It's down next to the cafeteria where the subway entrance is. Uh, and, uh, and this is a guy who basically built that institution. So, so uh, conclusion number one, legacy number one, is uh, all glory is fleeting. Uh, that uh, what, what can be a leading spokesperson of one generation uh, will, can be despised by the next. But more substantively, what does this tell us about scientists? As a scientist, I like to be listened to. I like to comment on things when somebody asks me. But not all scientists know everything. That may sound self-evident, but not all scientists know everything. And so when scientists, uh, as many, 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 many of them did, support something uh, that is not necessarily the same thing as thinking that it's right. Now, I say that with great uh, care because one of the things that this weekend is dedicated to is uh, educating the general public about evolution. One of the themes of this weekend is that every thinking biologist in America and, and the world accepts evolution. And that's true. That doesn't make it right, it just means that every thinking biologist in America thinks that it is. So is, does that make it right? No. And the, I think, so I think the last, the, the legacy of Osborne and eugenics is for us to be constantly skeptical. Uh, accept uh, and uh, claims only when they have been tested. Ask scientists why they think things. Investigate why scientists think things. Investigate what their biases might be. Ask them about their biases. Uh, don't be, don't doubt them just for the sake of doubting them, but always be skeptical because I, I don't think anybody could have imagined in the middle of the 1920s that in the 1940s or 50s or a uh, hundred years later that eugenics, which seems like the future of humanity and the best idea since evolution, <laughs> would be among the most despised ideas. And I think that that's a, um, a message for us about all the scientific ideas we hold today. Our next speaker is Brian Caviar. So, um, <laughs> so, yeah, <okay. laughs> So um, my presentation uh, is about eugenics at Cornell, um, and when you say that, probably the first thing people think if they know what eugenics is is, wow, you know, Cornell had uh, eugenics. That seems pretty, pretty odd. Um, and and you know, it, you should probably preface it with um, there were no negative or positive uh, reforms advocated or instituted or anything on that and on that level, and no, no university, to my knowledge, ever tried something like in, to that degree. But uh, but there was a course, Human Heredity and Eugenics, um, that lasted a pretty, pretty long time uh, through the 40s, um, which is kind of surprising to me at least. Um, they used the, the textbook um, Applied Eugenics by Paul Popineau and Roswell Hill Johnson, um, a book that includes statements as pretty much racist as you'll ever hear. Uh, but uh, at the time, as uh, Professor Provine uh, points out in an essay, Geneticist and Race, um, it seems that no uh, geneticist at the time had a bad thing to say about the book. It was well received, and and that was that. Um, but uh, probably getting ahead of myself, um, the, th the thesis of the paper. Uh, by the way, I wrote a paper, which is why I'm here. I probably should have said that first. Um, but uh, yeah, uh, the, uh, the thesis of that paper was that there's um, that Cornell really could have taken off with eugenics and and was well poised to do so. I mean. The College of Agriculture, uh, specifically the Department of Plant Breeding, um, was very attractive to uh, eugenicists uh, around the country. Um, Charles Benedict Davenport, 
uh, the leader of uh, American eugenics. I had frequent contact with, uh, with a number of the, the faculty there. Um, but it just didn't. Um, it, it didn't, I think, uh, for a very specific reason. Um, I, I think it, it didn't because Cornell is set up in such a way that the state and, and private side divisions, especially in the biological sciences, uh, it can cause a lot of problems. Uh, it can, can, can make um, an administrative you know, goals very difficult. Uh, so, so first things first then. Um, H.J. Weber is really the start of everything in, in the, the program. H.J. Weber was a geneticist, a um, plant breeding authority. It came from the U.S. Department of Agriculture. And uh, he was really the, the big man at, at the agriculture school at the time. Um, there were, for the most part, in 1907, the agriculture school consisted of people that still had their reputations to make, as uh, some have said. And, and Weber, uh, well known throughout the university, throughout the country even, uh, among, among plant breeders, was uh, the head of the department and, and the leader in many ways. Um, he also had a secondary interest in eugenics. And, is probably the most likely candidate to have made Cornell into uh, any, any eugenics program. There is a, uh, about 1912, 100 students, more or less, got together and formed a eugenics club. And with Weber, uh, they instituted a series of, of lectures in lieu of a formal course. Uh, the, the, uh, the lectures really were not from Weber's own research, as he'd done no research uh, on eugenics directly, uh, but were really from uh, what he'd heard from uh, Davenport himself. So, you know, if you would present a paper like geneticist, uh, eugenics from the point of view of a geneticist, and just espouse exactly what Davenport espoused. And this is 19 teens still, so it's, it's not well known yet that uh, eugenics is probably not the best science in the world. But, uh, it's neither here nor there. Weber also was trying to expand the agriculture college at the same time. He called it the most important work he ever had to do. Uh, and, and really, it, it should have been probably no problem for him to do it. There were increasing state appropriations. They need, I mean, they, they had a good reputation. It was growing. It, was, um, it seemed very promising. And they needed things like uh, plant, plant breeding buildings, central heating. Uh, very basic things, but they were looking to expand very rapidly. And, and the real problem didn't come from like, you know, what we would call probably special interest groups or, or anyone in the town or anything like that. It was the trustees themselves uh, debating about how to put that land to, to use. Uh, it seems that the, the problem was whether or not you would count, uh, I guess, what's now the Ag Quad maybe, uh, or the area around that pri private or, or state, state land. Um, shortly thereafter, Shortly thereafter, Weber just left. Um, he went to the University of California, where he was dean of the graduate program of agriculture. Uh, he had uh, facilities and a salary better than what Cornell could afford him. But I mean, you know, it's not like Weber would have up and left no matter what. He came to Cornell from the U.S. Department of Agriculture. He he wanted to. Start, I mean, he he wanted to uh, start a program at Cornell to develop it into something special. Um, and it just seems that, uh, you know, really these frustrations were just too much, too much for him to bear. And though it doesn't seem like it at first, that's, that's really the point uh, when eugenics at Cornell ends um, with Weber's departure, although there's some subsequent developments that, that would have been very interesting. Um, after, after Weber left, the um, administra administration tried to bring in Vernon Kellogg, uh, a noted eugenics um, proponent, uh, to come in and transform the Department of Plant Breeding into a Department of Genetics. But Kellogg, again, like um, Weber before him, uh, went to California. Uh, he went to Stanford University, where he could get facilities and a salary better than Cornell could offer him. So that failed. And R.A. Emerson was brought in. Uh, did, doesn't seem to have any particular interest in eugenics, although uh, through the years after, after Emerson, um, there were uh, eugenics uh, you know, conferences that Cornell faculty attended, and but but there was no there was no real great contact with uh, Davenport, for example, with the uh, one exception of A. W. Gilbert. Now, as much as, as Weber was sort of like this very well respected eugenics professor, it seems, uh, especially from one interview I had with a, a very great and aging professor here, uh, Royce P. Murphy. 
Um, Gilbert was not at all respected, um, and, but he was the only person remotely qualified to teach the course, uh, Eugenics and Human Heredity, when it was finally offered uh, shortly after Weber left. And Davenport, probably seeing that Gilbert is the person in this you know, agriculture school that he's courting for their resources, um, has continued contact with Gilbert. And, and at one point, in a strange series of back and forth where Gilbert is sort of not sure if he wants to take it, uh, it uh, Davenport offers him an editorship on the American Breeders Association's magazine, the uh, gen uh, like American Genetics magazine. Now, finally, Gilbert comes to an understanding where he's like, okay, I'm, I'm ready to take it. And then, very suddenly, it, it seems, uh, in the correspondence, uh, the, David Fairchild, the president of the American Breeders Association, um, basically stepped in um, and said, you know, no way, uh, there's, Gilbert cannot be the editor. So it, it was just a, a, strange, a strange man, and he was not, you know, in no way um, uh, the, same, the same character as, as Weber was for, for the university. Um, and he shortly, shortly thereafter, he left as well. He went to Harvard Business uh, School, which apparently, I guess, is what happens when you're a failed geneticist. You go to Harvard Business School. Um, That's what happens when you leave Cornell. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and, uh, and, and, and the course, the course went on without him. Uh, there was a, a Professor Frederick B. Hutt who taught it. Um, he was a member of the Ag School, an expert on poultry. Uh, he, he's an interesting character because at one point he was promoted to uh, the department head of the zoology department, which was at the time a private department. It was very strange for, a, for an agriculture you know, public uh, faculty member to head up a zoology department. And, and, and the, the, according to him, the results were mixed. Um, the people, you know, people in the department mocked him. They called him like that chicken expert from the agriculture college. He was not. Uh, it does not sound like a, like a wonderful situation. And, and then when the division of biology finally came around, apparently they didn't even, you know, the um, administration didn't even really look his way. The other faculty members thought, I guess, that he was not enough of a biologist, uh, as he says. So, um, so really, Frederick B. Hutt uh, you know, is, a, is, is the eugenics man at Cornell for, um, in, in the plant breeding department for some time until Adrian M. Serb. Uh, well-known genetics professor uh, wrote, co-wrote the general genetics textbook of his time that was, you know, the textbook, basically, um, picked up the course. It still had the same name, but he always referred to it as a genetics course, not a eugenics course. And, and with him, you can really mark sort of the end of eugenics at Cornell. Um, he, in his, in his book, there's an interesting passage when, at the very end, he talks about eugenics and the possibilities of eugenics. And, and, and his understanding of it is pretty close to what the understanding of it has been for like the last few decades. Um, that you know, while eugenics itself seems like a, a nice idea, you know, to improve mankind, uh, you know, particular impl you know particular uh, implications, you know, uh, implementations of eugenical ideas uh, are you know are controversial from a sociological and biological viewpoint, and in, in any case, it's probably just, there's not enough information on the topic to really talk about it in any depth, um, which, as I understand it, is you know, pretty much until fairly recently been uh, the way biologists view it. I don't know if that's, okay. <laughs> so, uh, so now, just uh, to go back um, to why, uh, you know, this uh, state private division was really played such an important role in the university. Um, I mean, had Weber stayed on, and, and, and he had the um, increasing appropriations from the expansion of the college, uh, you know, the support of Davenport, which Davenport was very much um, enthusiastic about, uh, you know, uh, Weber being at Cornell. Um, it, it seems likely he would have had the, the editorship. Um, he would have uh, been able to uh, continue on the eugenics course. Uh, there seems no reason why. Cornell could have made uh, a great deal more contributions to the field. Uh, so really, it, it seems like we missed it by a hair almost. Um, and in my paper, I, I opened it up with a sort of interesting little episode with uh, A.D. White. Uh, I guess I'll go into that here, just to sort of end it. Um, A.D. White was uh, away, which he often was in Europe. Uh, and this is after he was already first president of the university and U.S. Uh, ambassador to Berlin. Uh, he's currently a history professor at the university. 
And he ran into Francis Galton. They, uh, both of them um, thought the meeting was significant enough to record. Uh, White put it in his diaries and his autobiography. Uh, Galton wrote it in a letter to George Darwin, his cousin, um, that he had made the acquaintance of A.D. White. And, and both of them seemed to have thought the meeting was agreeable. Um, but in, it seems nothing else resulted from that. You know? It was just curious because A.D. White was a man who was well-renowned throughout the university as someone who could bring academics from Europe back to the university for teaching stints or lectures or, or whatever. Um, but there was never any follow-up on that. Now, the, the curious thing is, is White, uh, you know, sort of uncharacteristic, uncharacteristically, um, sorry, a year later turned towards nativism and his beliefs. Um, he was a moral philosopher and abolitionist for a long time. And it, it seems that Glenn Alshuler in, uh, in his book on White um, thinks that, you know, it was most likely connected to his wife Mary's death. Uh, somehow after that, White thought that the lines of evolution sort of pointed in one direction, uh, presumably downwards. Um, which is, you know, it, it, when, during the meeting, when he, at the time White probably thought that, you know, Galton's beliefs were diametrically opposed to his own. Um, but it sounds like, you know, a year later, uh, it could, things could have been very different. Uh, who knows? But uh, you know that's that's total speculation as opposed to just a little speculation. Um, so yeah, I think that's about the whole thing. Thank you very. Much. Our last speaker is Alan McNeil. Uh, in talking about this panel with some people in uh, evolutionary biology, uh, a couple people expressed some skepticism. You know, why in the world are you talking about eugenics? on a weekend that is supposed to honor Charles Darwin and evolutionary biology. And to just give you a feeling for why we're doing that, um, anyone who's taken an intro evolution course, especially anyone who's read um, uh, some of the sort of founding documents of what we still think of as the evolutionary synthesis, which is still taught in most introductory evolution courses, would recognize the names R.A. Fisher, Ronald Ilmer Fisher, and J.B.S. Haldane, John Burden Sanderson Haldane, as two of the key individuals in the founding both of theoretical population genetics and of the beginning of the modern evolutionary synthesis. Well, it's a curious thing that if you, if you go to Google and you switch to images and you type in R.A. Fisher, or J.B.S. Haldane, you will get pictures of both of them seemingly wearing the same outfit, a kind of a natty blazer with stripes on it. They're black and white, so you can't tell what color the stripes are. And a little straw boater. Haldane in particular looks particularly natty. He's sort of leaning into the camera like this with a cigarette in his fingers. Those outfits were the outfits of the stewards of the first and second eugenics conferences, both R.A. Fisher and J.B.S. Haldane, founders of the modern evolutionary synthesis, were stewards, active participants in eugenics conferences in England um, and in the United States. Indeed, if you look at the poster, sort of the iconic image from the second eugenics congress, I, I wish I had the ability to show you this, it's a tree, it's a really nice little tree here, with the picture of you, and it has eugenics across the top of the tree. The tree is, of course, a Darwinian tree, a tree of descent with modification. And the motto of the Second Eugenics Congress is, is strung out across the picture. That motto is, eugenics is the self-direction of human evolution. That was the motto of the Second uh, International Congress of Eugenics. In fact, eugenics was from the very beginning intimately tied with the development of the science of evolutionary biology. Francis Galton, the coiner of the term, was Charles Darwin's cousin. He was apparently at least partially stimulated to think about eugenics as the result of his reading of Darwin's works themselves. In particular, he paid attention to Darwin's speculations about the effects of civilization 
on the fitness of humans. Darwin proposed that civilization would have a debilitating effect on humans because those who in a state of nature would be eliminated as the result of natural selection because they were unfit in various ways were allowed to survive and to have children and would pass on if those traits were hereditary conditions that would never have survived in a state of nature. Galton went on from this and apparently really pricked his interest. Galton was a man who was widely recognized at the time, especially by himself, as perhaps the most brilliant man England had ever produced. He had a very high opinion of his own intelligence. He wrote a book, in, uh, actually an article in 18... Five, which he titled Hereditary Talent and Character, in which he talked about the importance of the inheritance of genius. Now, he didn't exactly say his own, but the implication was clearly there. And in 1969, 1969, 1869, he wrote a book on the subject entitled Hereditary Genius. In 1883, he coined the term eugenes, um, with, where we get the term uh, eugenics from. The book was entitled, Inquiries into Human Faculty and Its Development. In Hereditary Genius, he wrote this, I propose to show in this book that a man's natural abilities are derived by inheritance under exactly the same limitations as are the form and physical features of the whole organic world. Consequently, as it is easy, notwithstanding those limitations, to obtain by careful selection a permanent breed of dogs or horses gifted with particular powers of running or of doing anything else. So it would be quite practicable to produce a highly gifted race of men by judicious marriages during successive generations. Charles Darwin's cousin, with a statistician, a statistician named Carl Pearson, Galton developed a whole technology, which we now refer to as anthropometry. It was the biometric approach to the measurement of fitness in humans by measuring all sorts of things, the circumference of their skulls, um, you know, the length of their legs compared to their arms and so forth. This actually bled over into an artistic movement, the Pre-Raphaelites, who painted pictures of women with unusually long legs and short arms because, of course, this is the advanced form of humanity. The primitive form have long ape-like arms and short bowed legs. Anyway. Who were the people who supported the idea of eugenics? Alexander Graham Bell was a supporter of, gen of eugenics. He, and part of his work, in fact, part of the work that he accidentally and sort of as a side interest invented the telephone was work which he, pr which he pursued to help the deaf, but he also believed that the deaf should be strongly encouraged not to have children if not forcibly sterilized, because deafness was a bad thing. Henry Ford was an extremely dedicated gen uh, eugenicist and also racist. W.E.B. Du Bois, Marcus Garvey, Winston Churchill, Margaret Sanger, the founder of Planned Parenthood, and the science fiction writer Robert Heinlein, were all supporters of the idea of eugenics at various levels. Brian and, and uh, Will and, and uh, Warren have all mentioned Charles Davenport. Charles Davenport did not succeed in founding a department of eugenics at Cornell and in some sense, um, he didn't ex it didn't exactly happen this way, but around the same time he was successful in establishing a facility uh, which later became the eugenics record office at Cold Spring Harbor, uh, which some of you may recognize as a leading institute, private institute 
for the study of genetics today. Cold Spring Harbor was established as the eugenics record office um, in 1910 and, of course, after World War II, um, changed its focus, shall we say. Between 1900 and 1950, uh, over 13 states in the United States passed laws making illegal miscegenation, that is, marriage between the races, and a number of them passed laws requiring the involuntary sterilization of people that were considered to be genetically unfit. In 1927, in a famous Supreme Court case, Buck versus Bell, the Supreme Court upheld a law requiring involuntary sterilization. A famous quote from Justice Oliver Wendell Holmes at the time, in commenting on why he believed in the majority opinion was, three generations of imbeciles are enough. By 1945, over 45,000 mentally ill people, or, or not even mentally ill, they were classified by a whole series of classifications from feeble-minded to moron. Morons were high-functioning, feeble-minded people. Uh, were sterilized in the United States. By 1963, the time when the last involuntary sterilization law was uh, overturned, over 64,000 people in the United States were involuntarily sterilized. The United States was not the only country that did this. Canada systematically sterilized Native Americans in the Indian schools for over four decades. Sterilization laws and miscegenation laws or laws similar to these, including anti-immigration laws, were passed in Australia, the United Kingdom, Norway, France, Finland, Denmark, Estonia, Iceland, and Switzerland. In the United States alone, the policy of immigration policy, uh, the immigration policy as, I, as Warren has pointed out, was specifically designed to prohibit or to limit as much as possible immigration by those races considered to be genetically inferior. You've all heard of Down syndrome. Dr. Down, the person for whom the syndrome is named, tended to refer to it as Mongolian idiocy. And it was on the basis of his recommendations that Chinese and other Asians were excluded, were banned from immigration, because he believed that Down syndrome was an indication a clear indication to him that Asians were genetically inferior and obviously moronic and should be prevented as much as possible from immigrating and polluting the, uh, well, not to put too fine a point on it, the Aryan founders of the United States, which of course brings up the other country. In the 1930s, Ernst Rudin, a German writer and um, philosopher began to advocate policies of eugenics and forced sterilization in Germany. In the 1930s, a race office was established in the city of Nuremberg. This location was not accidental. Um, Hitler himself was deeply moved by the operas of uh, Richard Wagner, a virulent anti-Semite and racist, and made his cultural capital Nuremberg because that was where, of course, De Meistersinger was, De Meistersinger of Nuremberg. The Nuremberg race laws were patterned on proposals that were published by Henry Ford. In fact, the Nazis invited Ford to come to Nuremberg on at least one occasion and introduced him to other Germans and other people pursuing their policies by saying, this man, Henry Ford, is the man who inspires us. It is his policies which we are, uh, uh, are dedicated to and wish the rest of the world would follow. By the late 1930s, 450,000 people had been involuntarily sterilized in Germany. And we know what happened from then on. In 
1945, the Allies established a commission in which the leaders of the Third Reich were charged with war crimes and crimes against humanity. And the trial took place, of course, in Nuremberg, not by accident, but by design. The United Nations was established in the same year, actually a couple years later. And one of its most important agencies, the United Nations uh, uh, Economic, Social, and Cultural Organization, UNESCO, issued a statement in 1950 in which they unequivocally stated that one of the goals of the United Nations, and especially of UNESCO, was to promote the understanding among all peoples that there are no such thing as human races, or if there are, the races do not exist in significant ways between peoples. And that the, the policies that had led to the horrors of 1939 through 1945 would never be repeated. Eugenics Quarterly, a leading scientific journal and the subject of eugenics is still published, but its name was changed in 1969 to social biology. That's how eugenics is talked about these days. I came to Cornell in 1969. I changed majors a lot. I think I changed majors five times my first two years. Changed colleges twice. Still don't know what I want to be when I grow up. Um, but when I finally figured out that I wanted to be a biologist, I wanted to do biology as my major, I had a choice of two different genetics courses. The hard one. Everybody knows which one that is, right? That's Bio 281. Um, that was genetics, genetics. But there was also another course I could have taken at the time. That was human genetics. That was ta taught by Adrian Serb. Human genetics at Cornell in 1969 was, in no small way, the last continuation of the tradition of eugenics that was taught at Cornell. Now, I don't know if they still teach, do they still teach the course Human Genetics? Yes. They still do. Yes. I would bet all the rest of my paychecks for the rest of my life that the term eugenics is only used in a historical framework, if it is used at all in that course. Eugenics, in other words, as, as Warren said, Henry Fairfield Osborne attempted to staple racism to evolutionary biology. Well, folks, that would not have been difficult. The same people who we revere as the founders of the modern evolutionary synthesis, not all of them, but significant members, were themselves eugenicists. They believed in the policy. They believed in the so-called science of eugenics. It's an admonitory lesson to all of us that the data comes first and the theory comes second. And especially, politics is not part of this. It has no legitimate place in science whatsoever that when science becomes harnessed to politics, both science and politics lose. Anyway, that's it. Thank you, panel. We will now open for discussion from the floor. There's a microphone, and you must speak into the microphone so you can be recorded. And we welcome your comments and questions. Would anybody like to make a comment? You might have been surprised that my three colleagues talked about a version of eugenics that completely died out, and I argued that it's back in a very big way, already bigger than any of the stuff they talked about, and they didn't say a word about it. <laughs> okay, I'll bite. Um, <laughs> As usual, I will take issue with your um, saying that it's bigger today than it was oh, yeah. then. I think, I think that um, that hides the, the
the, the fact of how big it was then. And, and everything's bigger now than it was then. So uh, I just want to, uh, uh, I didn't know this. I'm not a historian of, of biology by training. So it was a great discovery to me to read uh, over my career about famous evolutionary biologists and paleontologists who believed this stuff. It was, it, this was not a fringe belief. This was, this was where it was at in terms of, of biology and, uh, and evolution. And so um, uh, I, don't, I don't question anything you say, Will, about the, uh, how important genetic screening and counseling are today. They're absolutely, I've personally been sitting in a room with my wife having the discussion that you, that you quoted about genetic uh, testing. They want you to do it and so forth and so forth. But it isn't part of academic evolutionary biology today. No. And uh, at least in, in a very open way. Um, and that's a big change. That's a huge change. And listening to uh, everybody else talk up here, I guess I'm, I'm just struck, and I, I didn't say this, I had meant to, but I didn't say this, that had World War II not happened, had, in other words, had, had the Nazis and World War II not happened, it's, it's one of those um, what-if questions of history. First of all, would, uh, would, would eugenics have survived as, as science until something like the Third Reich happened? Uh, in some other context? Uh, or uh, would eugenics still be, would that course still be called eugenics today at Cornell? In other words, would, would, would eugenics have survived if, the, if, if we hadn't had the bejesus scared out of us by Hitler? That's one, one question. Would I don't know the Would the eugenics answer. record office be up on Tower yeah, Road? That's right. Would you, that's right. Would there be a <laughs> eugenics record office? And, and as we learn, and as when Watson and Crick came along in the 1950s, what would we have done with that information? Maybe Will's answer is, is the answer to that. But, and then the, but the other point is, what would happen, have happened to evolutionary biology had eugenics not been discredited? In other words, would, would the history of evolutionary biology have been the same if World War II had never happened and people like Osborne were not discredited and eugenics was not discredited? And I, th this is somewhat like what would, would Lincoln have preferred Max or PCs, but um, <laughs> it, it, it's just an interesting. Max. It's just an interesting question to to ask um, how history of science, which is supposedly driven by data and and you know objective reasoning and so forth, how it could be derailed or or changed by events like the rise of the Nazis, which on the surface anyway has nothing to do with evolutionary biology. And, I, and I, I, I think that's a really, really interesting question, not just academic historically, but as, as Will alluded to, current trends. Uh, there, there are a number of books out and lots of blogs and so forth about how science is manipulated politically today. And so if, and global warming is a good example, um, uh, how evolution is taught in the schools is a good example. Uh, stem cell research is a good example. In other words, when uh, how science is deflected, changed, directed, manipulated, etc., uh, as science by non-scientific factors, and I think that that is by no means a, a, a done deal. And so, even though biology is utterly different than it was in the 1920s. Eugenics persists for the reasons that Will points out in a non-biological context today, and the, and the issue of what affects the course of science, I think, is still very much with us, and I think those are very good reasons for, that we should, that Alan, I hope you told your colleagues over in Corson about why this panel was relevant. Now, Will, you can disagree with everything. Somebody coming up with uh, a question. Great. You speak right up. There's a, there's a, yeah, speak right into the mic. I missed the first three speakers, so you may have covered this thing. So uh, eugenics had a, a, a political basis, kind of, as Alan was speaking about. But n now um, science is so wrapped up in money. And um, I would actually say that DNA is the monetary basis of life. <laughs> <laughs> and... Um, and that is our new ethics, our new philosophy, everything. And uh, I believe that will move the, the, our 
eugenics issues uh, through reproductive, techno reproductive technology, et cetera. I completely agree with that, and you might be interested, and you probably know that Iceland sold its DNA. And that's the, that, you're right, the DNA is the source of a huge amount of money, and people are being much more protective about sharing what they know about their DNA. That raises a most serious problem, namely, should you be forced to share what you know about your DNA with your insurance company, your life insurance company in particular? When you know something that the insurance company doesn't know, they make their figures on the basis of them not knowing and you not knowing, and then they're willing to make a deal with you. But if you know your genome and they don't, and you know you want to buy a huge amount of life insurance because you've got Huntington's disease, and you would prefer that they didn't know that you knew you had that, then there's a very serious problem. Mm -hmm. And there's a lot of national legislation that's being set up right now to, uh, to actually ensure that people will have privacy on their understanding of their own DNA. If that happens, I predict life insurance will go out of style and we won't have any more. Companies will terminate it. It may be more complicated than that because we may not be allowed to share our DNA with the insurance companies because Monsanto may actually have a patent <laughs> on our own genes and we would have to pay Monsanto enormous amounts of money before we could even think of sharing our DNA. That raises with an interesting companies. point that Monsanto and the insurance companies could just fight about it and leave us out. Right. <laughs> <laughs> I want to follow up on something that Will mentioned. Um, I had a student in evolution two years ago who wrote a really brilliant paper. In fact, it was a finalist the year after Ryan won the, the Tallman Award for the Tallman Award that year. She wrote a paper about um, a very widespread practice in Israel and in some Jewish communities in which uh, it's called shidduch. Uh, the, the matchmakers take very detailed um, life histories. And um, in fact, in Israel, uh, there's a program called Dor Yeshorim, where the government funds um, genetic testing for a whole slew of conditions, Tay-Sachs, cystic fibrosis, Canavan. Uh, Fanconia anemia, familial dysautonomia, glycogen storage disease, Gaucher's, so forth and so on. And on the basis of that genetic information, very strongly counsels people on who they should marry and what children they should have, if any. Or what matches are not Or what, not what matches are, are not permissible by essentially, um, you know, uh, uh, an extension of Jewish law. Now this is clearly eugenics and again it's eugenics under the name of genetic counseling. Now, I actually ran into this about four months ago. My wife and I are expecting a baby. We already have three kids um, but we lost one last year miscarriage and so as a result they did more extensive genetic testing and lo and behold my wife found out that she was heterozygous for what what do you think one in 20 in Caucasians cystic fibrosis she was heterozygous for this so instantly I had to go and be tested because if I'm heterozygous for cystic fibrosis then we've been rolling the dice for those other three kids. And the probability that the next one would be homozygous for cystic fibrosis. Come on, quick. No, 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 no. What's the probability? Quick. Yeah, good, one in four. Get that, man, two points. Yes. You know, she's heterozygous and I'm heterozygous, simple Mendelian cross. You know, the probability it's three to one or one to two to one, actually. And so the probability that we'll have a child with cystic fibrosis is one-fourth. Now, I knew a little bit more about it. I knew that all of my ancestors pretty much came from northern England, the Hebrides of Scotland. And the cystic fibrosis is so high among northern Europeans because of 
of uh, cholera. The, the frequency of the allele for cystic fibrosis is high among people whose ancestors came from northern Europe because being heterozygous for cystic fibrosis provides some protection against cholera. And that's why its frequency is 1 in 20 among northern Europeans. Same argument as the high frequency of the, of the sickle cell an, uh, anemia allele among people who live where malaria is endemic. So I told my wife, you know, let, let's just do a quick calculation, back of the envelope thing. And I figured, you know, my, my father, my grandfather, they're all from, from Scotland, they're from the Hebrides. No cities up there, no cholera, and therefore, you know, we could put down zero as that probability. It's really easy calculation after that. Uh, and so I calculated that the probability that I would actually be a carrier was something like 1 in 25,000 or something like that. Turned out that I'm homozygous, uh, normal, do not have the allele. But here's the kicker. If I had found out that I was heterozygous, then we would almost certainly have done well, by that time, it would have been amniocentesis. It's back to past the point where you can do chorion villi sampling. And if we had found out that, you know, Draco, <laughs> we know he's a boy, um, was homozygous recessive for cystic fibrosis, then what were our choices? Now, we had to talk about this because there was a week in between when we found out she was heterozygous and I found out I was homozygous normal. And I argued, well, you know, it's a tough life for a kid. But genetic engineering is proceeding so fast that it's quite possible that by the time he was at the age at which cystic fibrosis usually kills people, he might even have a, we might even have a treatment for it, an inhaled lipid droplet, for example, with a little piece of the gene for the, the chloride ion regulator that is gone bad in cystic fibrosis. And I jokingly told her we could just add to the genetic load. Right? This little kid who's homozygous for a homozygous lethal gene could go on and have kids and every one of them would pass on that allele. Well, that's a eugenic argument. You know? Genetic counseling is all about eugenics. It's just not called that anymore. Uh, Other comments from the audience? <laughs> so uh, Warren had mentioned this sort of thought of experiment about what would have happened if World War II hadn't come along um, and if uh, we didn't have this tr transition away from eugenics. But I wondered if any of you know what the history of eugenics outside of West, the, you know, in the Soviet bloc or, or Eastern Europe was where maybe some of the same principles didn't apply. Hmm. There have been books written about this. Indeed, my friend Mark Adams at UPenn edited a book on eugenics in a number of European countries. Uh, I know that Norway, France, Denmark, and a number of other countries were included in that. It was mostly had a European kind of basis. Russia was in that. And every single one of those countries had a eugenics movement that was very lively. And they all sent the representatives to the 1924 Congress at the American uh, Museum in, in New York City. And so Osborne and Osborne's name really drew a huge crowd of people interested in eugenics from all around the world. You just have to go to the proceedings of the conference and read who was there. It's a who's who of genetics, it's a who's who of evolutionary biology, and it's a who's who of eugenics, people who just were in a career of eugenics. They were the but same it was people. mostly geneticists and evolutionists. Rob, you were also asking about non-European and non-U.S. Right. Well, it doesn't get talked about oh. this way, but I just heard a, a thing in the news about uh, uh, China, which uh, this doesn't get labeled eugenics, but in 10 years or something like this, China will have 40 million more men than men. women. Yeah. Which, 
which numerically isn't that huge uh, for China's population, but it means there are 40 million men who will not have wives, uh, potentially. And what will that mean and so forth? Polyandry. And, <laughs> Good idea. And, and so, <laughs> so that's not called eugenics, but clearly the um, either abortion or in, as I understand it, many cases outright infanticide of, of, of uh, uh, female children in China, that, that's eugenics. Um, they can determine now early enough with yeah. sonar uh, equipment and tell whether ultrasound, whether it's a male or a female, and bingo, you, you're all there. So and, that's, that's and the only thing I can see is going to happen from this is that women wonderfully will become more valuable in China, and that's great for women's uh, uh, future in China. And, and also demographically, if women become more valuable, they will get more education, and we know mm. that education of women lowers birth rates. It's what happened in the West. And, and I, I, I think, um, Will, are there, are there studies of non-Western, non-European, Yes. Eugenic kinds yes. Of yeah. Yes. Uh, certainly, Japan has had a strong eugenics movement in the early 20th century. They had a number of representatives at the 1924 conference. Singapore has had, in modern times, the liveliest eugenic program of any place in the whole world. So yes, there are uh, there are eugenics uh, ideas in Asia and and apart from the Western I also influence. remember, I can't remember who said it, but I remember an anthropologist calling the caste system in India the closest thing to, to uh, the, an attempt to make a, a new human species. Uh, in, in other words, the, the caste system was invented in part to keep people from breeding with people that they weren't right. supposed to. Yeah, people have been, as, as Will points out, people have been choosing who to marry for a long time. <laughs> and the effects of that have been widespread. Uh, you know, part of the genetic variegation of, of the human species is the result of the restriction of, of gene flow between different populations. Uh, uh, just to pick up on this, um, in Latin America, uh, Argentina and Brazil ha had until recently, the same kinds of immigration policies, which were explicitly eugenic in origin that the United States did, and also continuing even up to the present day, there is a, it, it's difficult to think of what happens in the Indian schools, like the schools for Native Americans in Canada, the schools for Native Americans in the United States, run by the BIA, by the, the way. The schools for Aborigines The schools for Aborigines, Aborigines in Australia, the schools for the Quechua in Peru, the schools for various indigenous peoples in Brazil in particular. It's difficult to think of those programs as anything but eugenic in origin because one of the things that happened routinely in those schools, in Canada in particular, is those kids were sterilized especially the girls, they were sterilized. And they were discouraged from having children with other native people. It was okay if they had children with, you know, those Aryan types. Those were okay because your bad genes would get diluted out by the good ones. Um, and so a few really altruistic Aryans would sacrifice some of their fitness by, you know, diluting that out. But, you know, eugenics by other names has been practiced systematically and in some ways still is. Ask and, any and kid from a BIA school what it was like. Next question. You know, you're talking about using technology to influence genetics. Mm -hmm. Have you, you know, you're thinking of the next steps is how about almost using technology to bypass biology? Yeah. I was originally gonna say, Imagine if you could have a perfect Android body, then if you had a part was going bad, you just go to the store and replace it, and you could be virtually immortal. Um, but I was thinking even beyond that, why stick to something that's just a representation of what we have now? 
I'm sure the technology, you know, something even more advanced, more sophisticated, so that your mind could be, you know, I know this is getting way off into... It's not. It, it's no, not. It's not you're, I'm sorry, you're not getting way off right. at all. Oh, One good. of the brochures, yeah. And, and, yeah. Uh, Kurzweil predicts that within 50 years, at the outside, at the far outside, mm -hmm. we're going to be able to download human brains into computers, <laughs> and they can be conscious just as they are inside of your head, and maintain there. You can turn the computer off, turn it back on again, turn you on, and there you are again. <laughs> It, he thinks that that's going to be possible within a relatively short time. And I'm going to be in a Mac, believe download me, no Windows to computers. <laughs> uh, and, and furthermore, um, uh, gene therapy as, a, as opposed to genetic counseling yeah. is, uh, is, is much wished for among, um, in, in biomedicine right now. So we, if, if, if you had had a cystic fibrosis child, yeah. then it could be fixed, right? right? It could well, be that's, repaired. We talked about that. We talked about, do we have them anyway, and hope that in 15 years, there'll be a therapy but for But of course, this. if you could do that, then you could do a bunch of other stuff, too. Sure. You, uh, and well, so absolutely. if, yeah. so, and, and this is not new, obviously, people have were, were been worrying about this for a long time. So, so we haven't even talked about, we tried to get somebody, by the way, who would who would know something about this, but we couldn't for this panel. But we haven't even talked about the brave new world of, of manipulating genes, which yeah. will clearly be eugenics. One of the other things we had to decide last week, because that was the deadline, was whether or not we would spend the 2500 bucks that it costs to have your embryonic cord blood of your baby sucked out of the umbilical cord and frozen in liquid nitrogen in some lab out in California on the chance that between now and when our son needed a new liver or whatever, his frozen embryonic cord blood would have the stem cells in it to grow that stuff. And we finally decided, you know, we didn't have that kind of spare change lying around. But it also occurred to me, you know, there's a whole lot of corpsicles out there, uh, dead people in, in liquid nitrogen, and the technology is going to go beyond them in some sense. In 20 years, I mean, think about this. The structure of DNA was figured out 53 years ago. That's all. I was two years old. By the time our son is my age, they won't need that cord blood anymore. I, I'm quite confident that all the people who are spending $2,500 now to have their kids' cord blood frozen so that there'll be embryonic stem cells in that corn blood that they could use to make livers and hearts and whatever will be, will be money lost, will be money wasted because it'll be possible to get stem cells in other ways by then. But that's just an example. That's an example of how people right now, today, are making decisions on the basis of those kinds of technologies and making decisions about, you know, do we have this cord blood frozen or do we sort of bank on the idea that we won't need it in 20 years? <laughs> Just, <laughs> right. Right, exactly. One, one point I'd like to bring up, which is kind of connected to the rest of this weekend, uh, it is very frequently raised as an objection to evolution by, by non-scientists that uh, Darwinism has been put to nefarious purposes. And uh, it's, it's no secret that if you read uh, any of the books about Nazi medicine, Nazi science, Nazi doctors, it, uh, if you look in the index, there's a big section under Darwin. Uh, and one reason we're up here talking is, is that eugenics was, was uh, part and parcel of, of Darwinism in the early 20th century. It is very frequently, if you look in creationist books and websites and so forth, you will very frequently see that one of the things that evolution is that it can be used for bad things. 
and, uh, is exactly what we're talking about. But uh, it's also a very uh, common rejoinder to that, response to that, that all kinds of science can be used for all kinds of bad things, or it can be used for good things, and that those two are not necessarily connected. But clearly all the things we've been talking about up here show that, that there's, a, there's, a, there's not a bright line between science that is used for good things and science that is used for bad things. Eugenics was believed to be one of the great hopes of humanity a uh, hundred years ago. It was believed to be one of the great things that we could do with science. And then it turned out that there were, and, and as I think uh, uh, Alan said, the, the idea behind eugenics, if you will, is a great one, right? That, we, that humanity could be better. I mean, how can you, how can you uh, disagree with that? Of course, the, the problem is the definition of better. And am I better or are you better? And so, so eugenics was this noble notion that nobody could disagree with uh, uh, until it was actually applied. Um, and then when it got applied, you got people being sterilized in Virginia and you got uh, Jews being massacred in, in Germany. And so, uh, but that doesn't affect whether inheritance is true and it doesn't affect whether Darwinian natural selection happens. Uh, just the way uh, atomic physics has nothing to do with the fact you can make bombs out of it. So I think that that's, that's also worth keeping in mind during all of this discussion, uh, that, that, the, that science is science as science, that is science as, as understanding the way the world works, is amoral, not not evil, but without moral content in and of itself. The problem is that humans are not amoral, and humans do science, and so what we do with the information that we have is not a scientific decision. Uh, what we do with information and how we use it and how we manipulate it, those are all very, very non-scientific decisions, and what we've just been hearing about is, is the, the, the warning label that comes on science, which is, uh, be careful how you apply what it is the science has learned about the way the world works. Any questions? Well, yeah, so I, I'd like to say something about um, the amoralness of science and um, the physicists that worked on the atomic bomb. So I think the physicists that worked on the atomic bomb were, um, whether they thought it was a wonderful thing or a horrible thing, they were very thoughtful and outspoken and contributed enormously to society into the debate. I would say the biologists currently are um, relatively silent in terms of the intellectual discussions of what can happen with the eugenic kind of things we're talking about, be it plant or animal or human. And, um, and it's sort of the, the, the philosophy is, well, it's going to be done or everybody's doing it. I don't think the biologists have the, the bigness that the physicists had in the 40s. You ought to write an article on that topic <laughs> and submit it to science and or nature because your point is extremely well taken yeah. and by and large biologists would prefer to just let that thing go instead of getting their nose all into it. And physicists had the courage to go ahead and, and stick their noses into it and try to advise their governments on how to use this atomic power. We don't do that in biology by and large, and it's a very dangerous thing. I have a paper written, twice rejected, entitled <laughs> <laughs> Model Scientists, thinking that, you know, model organisms is what everybody's talking about. Yeah. But nobody's talked about that model scientist. Well, but Will, it's, well, it's easy to sit back now and, and praise Robert Oppenheimer because <laughs> he was so brave. Because we know how it comes out. We know how the story comes out. I mean, if, 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 if I don't happen to know, but there are a lot of, I mean, bioethics didn't exist 50 years ago, for example, as a field. So now there are bioethics panels and there's, bio, maybe they're not doing, maybe they're not up to the job. But and there's Arthur Kaplan. 
Of course, of course. No, I mean, there's, there's, there's other forces at work here. I'm just saying that, that it's very easy to say, and, and I would argue that Robert Oppenheimer didn't say, and, and Einstein didn't say all the good things that they said because they were scientists of a particular sort, but because they were the human beings that they were. I mean, and, and uh, I don't think physicists, I certainly do not think physicists are inherently better than biologists for a number of reasons, but um, uh, I think we have the benefit of hindsight. I mean, how do we know how this is all going to work out 50 years from now? We don't. Do you mean that biologists don't speak out on this for fear of their own careers? Of course that's true for Heavens some of them. Heavens but, but I also know that there are people whose careers consist of speaking out on this. Now, one of the questions, and this is why it comes back to we know how it comes out in the end, one of the questions might be who's listening to them? So in other yeah. words, I mean, there's no shortage of voices today, right? Just get on the internet. So who's listening to the voices? And so if somebody is, if somebody is saying that uh, gene therapy or genetic counseling or stem cell research is a good or a bad thing, that, that may mean nothing unless the right person in government is hearing that. And so I think the point is well taken that scientists have an obligation to use their, their informed opinion, to, to state their informed opinion. But what if a politician never hears them? That's not the scientist's fault. I would put se. this a slightly different way. I don't think that what you do is to stand up as a scientist and to use your expertise to make your social point. You stand up as an individual who has gained prestige because of your science to make a human point about how you would like the society to be. In other right. words, you don't try to make it look like your scientific expertise leads to your social conclusion. And Absolutely. too often that occurs that people use their science as a kind of a shield for themselves to talk about the implications of science. That, I think, is a great mistake because what we're making are ethical issues and the science doesn't have the ethics written into it. And therefore, I think it's better simply to use your own prestige as a scientist to participate in the, th in the debate rather than to pretend that your science leads you to where you are. Under the present administration, of course, scientists have no prestige, so it doesn't matter. Right. They're members of the reality-based community. You want to say something else? Yeah, so, so um, <laughs> well, I was going to say the same thing. As, as individualists, as in, there was no bioethics title, but there were certainly um, a lot of scientists that spoke out. Uh, Joseph Priestley, who I'm just reading about today, for example. Um, but um, why doesn't government listen? So that's a very good question. So built into the Declaration of Independence, where we talk about building a government based on the laws of nature and nature's God, and, and throughout the Constitution, where, where um, we talk about the importance of s patents or science and, and for, in terms of patents, the government has a huge interest in, in science. So um, the question is, why don't they listen to scientists? And then I think that comes right down to the, um, the, the lobbyists that uh, the lobbyists are so outspoken with money and scientists are so mesmerized with the money that comes from those same companies that are supporting the lobbyists, you, that there you, is no second point. Obviously, you don't understand the situation in the government about the support of evolutionary biology. <laughs> now, let's go to National Science Foundation, which is a source of funding for projects on evolution and we go to the evolution section of NSF. What? There's no evolution there section? There isn't one. Oh, gosh. There isn't any, is there? <laughs> if you submit a grant proposal that uses the E word, it gets edited out. And you apply to population biology, which doesn't sound very threatening. Or demographics, which sounds even more, you know. Uh, it's, it's really a very dicey thing, how you support evolution in the United States through the U.S. government. And so I think it's a very difficult issue, and it makes evolutionists rather mm, kind of dicey when it comes to talk about things like religion and things like that, because they don't want to say what they really think about those issues, 
because they don't want to appear anti-American in their views uh, about life and so on. We, can ha we have about time for another question from the audience. Is there somebody else who would like to make a comment? We'd love to hear from someone else. Yeah. Here we go. There We've we got go. him right here. I was just curious. Uh, was there actually any experimental evidence that came with the Indian eugenics, or was it really <laughs> mostly its connection with racism and mass murder that had killed it? Charles Benedict Davenport, who was the person who really founded eugenics in the United States, ran the eugenics record office for many years. He published a book in 1911, and that was the best book on human heredity and our understanding of it of anyone for the next 15 or so years. It's unbelievable how much Davenport and his wife Gertrude knew about human genetics. They really knew a, a great deal about specific kinds of deformities and how they were inherited in Mendelian patterns. So there was, uh, the eugenics movement was not devoid of careful interest in human heredity. In 1924, when those people all gathered at the museum in New York City, you had the world experts on human heredity. The big German two-volume work had just come out in 1923, and the two authors were at the Congress. So yes, there was an understanding of human genetics right up to the cutting edge in 1924. But they were in there arguing that eugenics was the only hope for mankind and getting intense agreement on that. So the, these people are not stupid with regard to human heredity. They are in it up to their necks. They understand it better than anyone else in the world and they still have these views about its best use, namely eugenics. Because there's, there's really at least two issues. I'm sure there's more than this, but there's really two issues. One is human heredity is not an issue. I mean, humans are, are mammals, and they inherit things the way mammals do. So that's not an issue, and we've known that since Mendel. What, what the first issue, which is still an issue, is what is the heritability, what is the genetic in, in, uh, inheritance potential of particular features of a particular human being? And we still don't know that. And we may never know all of that, even if we've, we've sequenced and understood absolutely everything. So if you have a certain hair color, that's probably got higher heritability than uh, whether you're interested in um, uh, uh, Afghan history, uh, but, uh, but who knows? Uh, it, it, cancer may or may not have heritability, et cetera. So that was one of the issues at the Congress and, and in, in scientific eugenics is not whether heritability happens, but is, is criminal behavior heritable? Is uh, feeble-mindedness, uh, can it be identified and is it heritable? Uh, that's still with us today. And whether there's evidence for that or not, you should read a book like The Bell Curve or Mismeasure of Man. Uh, but then beyond that, and this is what I was trying to get at but when, with my comment earlier, is even if we could know what the heritability of every single trait is, was, there would still be the issue of what to do about it. Because if, if we knew the heritability, if we knew the Mendelian heritability, if we knew the molecular genetics of every single trait, that would not necessarily tell us anything about what, if anything, to do about it. Should Alan have a baby or not? Does, does knowledge tell us that? Uh, d should, uh, uh, should we ban immigrants from America? <laughs> does heritability tell us anything about that? Should we uh, sterilize certain kinds of people? Does heritability tell us anything about that? I would say it doesn't tell us one single thing about it. And that's, that's really the point, and that's why science doesn't tell you everything. And, and uh, science doesn't tell you when life begins, and it doesn't tell you whether you should sterilize people, and it doesn't tell you whether to do stem cell research, and it doesn't tell you whether to euthanize people. It, it, science tells you the way the world is. 
And in that, it's only partially successful, and it does not, absolutely does not, inform you one way or the other about what to do with that information, I, I think, would say. I think that's the perfect place for us to end, I the foremost. <laughs> oh, I had a good, I go had right, a good. go right ahead. I would like to ask the panel, what are your thoughts on me MAMES or MEMES, M-E-M-E-S? Oh, yeah, <laughs> that, that'll be my final question. I'm very curious this, about that. This is the real challenge because uh, Richard Dawkins not only wanted to capture the market on the selfish gene, he wanted to capture the market on self selfish memes, <laughs> which are cultural genes. But they don't reproduce, of course, the way the other kinds of genes reproduce. And therefore, you have lateral transfer in them, and you have the web that I talked about earlier in one of these sessions. You can't get a tree of life going back to the origin of life because when you go back beyond multicellular organisms, there is unfortunately a lot of lateral transfer between the different kinds of bacteria. And that means you get, go back about 0.6 billion years, and bingo, you're into this, and you cannot construct a, an evolutionary tree that goes back to the origin of life. It's impossible to do that. And that's because of this, all this lateral transfer. So if you try to understand evolution in terms of cultural means, you have exactly the same problem. It's a horribly complex web instead of something that you can pursue the way we pursue evolutionary biology. And frankly, in my opinion, the use of means is al almost zero. But I think that Alan would disagree with me very strongly. Actually, I wouldn't. Uh, just as a commentary on this, there was, in fact, you can still get it. Uh, go, go to Google and type in Journal of Mimetics, M-E-M-E-T-I-C-S. It ceased publication two years ago. Uh, when it first came out, it's an online publication. It was hugely popular and had immense numbers of hits and had lots and lots of articles submitted. And after, you know, about three years, the, the number of articles submitted and the number of hits fell off exponentially. And, and now it's basically a ghost site. Um, all of the, of the excitement about memes disintegrated about, I would say, probably two years ago. And almost nobody, and certainly nobody who used to do all that stuff still talks about it. I think the main reason is because you can't capture it mathematically. And if you can't capture it mathematically, eventually scientists are not going to talk about it anymore. Um, but that's another discussion on another panel for another year. <laughs> Thank you all very, very much indeed. And I think we should give yeah, this panel yeah. a... What a loyal audience. My oh. gosh. Uh, you'll all get your checks at the door back then. <laughs> So come back tonight um, in this room at 7 o'clock. David Sloan Wilson.